So team, tonight we're or today we're going to be talking about pipes. When we were ref referencing the data science workflow or the tidyverse modeling uh, concept, not even the word modeling, just the workflow of ingesting media, wrangling media, making transformations, and then trying to provide some level of production output of what our findings are. You can write your code in a form that is very computer science oriented, or you can start to uh, capture or take advantage of the uh, pipe option within the Magritar, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Mag Magritar uh, package that it allows for a memory ingest, or sorry, memory process uh, it's, it's, it's just much cleaner. It produces a lot cleaner and easier transferable code. Uh, when we read a particular pipe operation, it's uh, you're passing variables from one function to another. So it's like, and this, or, and then do something else. I'm going to, I'm going to transform something and then pass it to another function and then pass it to another function. Um, so the learning objectives of pipes that I have for this chapter include using the pipe operator to make code more readable. The whole intent here is to uh, uh, sanitize or allow your code to be reproducible by others and be easily read and interpreted, debugged by other users as well. I do have a sub bullet here uh, talking about the left hand side and the right hand side of the operator. Um, if you read any of the documentation of Magritur or the uh, Tidyverse uh, or any other uh, forms of, of this operation, they will always talk about LHS and RHS. I stumbled over those during my reading because I was trying to understand what they were referring to. And then it dawned on me it's left hand side and right hand side of the operator. The second bullet is recognizing when not to use the pipe operator. Uh, there's a section in our chapter uh, where we are uh, saying that these are probably not good use cases for the use of the pipe operator. And then finally, the last bullet statement is reviewing other pipe operators that may be helpful uh, that expand other services within the Magritur uh, package. Uh, John, I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing the terminology <laughs> properly. I, so I can't do a proper French accent. It's okay. named after the French uh, painter Magritte. So M Magritte, Magritte R. R. Ah, um, I just sense. say Magritte. Magritte. Um, okay. And it's if you want to, if the reason it's named that is Magritte has the famous painting of a pipe that underneath it it says in French this is not a pipe, and so I see. It is the pipe package, so they named it after him. Very good. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't do any background research on the naming <laughs> convention at all, but I did read that there was a bunch of debate on its pronunciation. And I find that always a comical point within our, our studio environment uh, because we are a global um, representation that there is a lot of inflections and, and some backstories that go along with naming packages, et cetera. Yeah, I think... I think they might have taken it out, but it used to have an introduction that said it should be pronounced, like it specifically told you to pronounce uh, it like the uh, painter. And then I've listened to talks with like Hadley or you know other people who are very deeply involved in the package and they don't pronounce it like the painter. So I think McGritter good. is McGritter. fine. McGritter. McGritter. I guess technically, you know, if you want the, the technical pronunciations are ironically um, comes from New Zealand, which is um, a, what is it, rhotic or non-rhotic, whatever it is, where they don't really pronounce R's at the end of words. So ironically, R, I think the proper pronunciation is ah. <laughs> so Magritta. Interesting. <laughs> That's another twist onto the, uh, the naming convention there. Yeah. Oh. So pronounce um, it with a New Zealand accent is the uh, proper pronunciation, or I guess in this case, it'd be Denmark, whatever. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only smiling at the 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 uh, capital M lowercase c, if, if you were to spell it phonetically, and it, now yeah. it's like McGriddle or uh, <laughs> McMuffin, Mc, Mc, yeah. something, the McDonald's uh, goes to it. Anyway, sorry. Uh, anyway, all right. so my yeah. point on that, all of that is um, I don't have a really good pronunciation of this one. Pronounce it how it's comfortable to you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Uh, our next slide 
excuse me, is uh, the introduction slide. So the pipe operator comes from the McGritter package by Stefan Milton Bach. Um, he is not, he's just the author of the package. There is another maintainer and I did not cite um, who that current maintainer is at the moment. Um, if we go to the website, um, it will expand on who the maintainer is. Um, uh, the link that we have here to our uh, Stefan Milton Bach, um, it is his, I think his public profile, I think it's almost like an online CV. Uh, so if you want to learn more about uh, this particular author or, or a package author, um, you're welcome to, to follow that particular link. I made a statement here, but I, <clears throat> it's extremely bold and I don't know if it's correctly cited. And so I, I added another note here. If you use any of the Tidyverse libraries, these are, these are libraries that are produced uh, for the tiny universe uh, or tidy universe. Um, I didn't see it pulled in tidy models, but um, there are in Advanced R and some other books that also make references to the same claim. What I was going to ask John is how do you validate dependencies within a particular package? So if I call in tidyverse, I know that the uh, system will automatically uh, print um, the current linkages. How do I ask the question or, or how do I find it on CRAN to tell me what other libraries also use uh, McGritter in the, in the uh, libraries? So you can look at um, the reverse imports on okay, CRAN. That's, that's the level, okay. Yeah, and then that'll tell you other packages that use it, but the problem is it doesn't um, go up the tree. And so since, since all of the core tidyverse packages also export the pipe, a lot of packages just require, you know, Tibble or TidyR or something, um, which from there they get the pipe. So yeah. McGritter is actually required, you know, if you go up the tree, I mean, already if you just look at the reverse imports on CRAN, um, let me go ahead and copy the link. Yeah, it's actually um, quite extensive. There's there's many, right. many, many libraries that call on this particular package, um, it, the statement I was making as far as being bold is that I'm saying that any of the tidyverse libraries, right. and I, I have reason to believe that may be an incorrect statement. Um, I, I think it is true in if you follow the, the path. Like, okay. um, uh, the tidy models, like tidy models imports tidy R, which imports mm -hmm. Tibble. So I think all the way and along. The, imports, yeah, 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 that makes sense. I mean, sorry, which imports uh, McGritter directly, I think, or it might do it through Tibble, actually. And so, yeah, that's the other thing is if you look at the um, CRAN page for Tibble, reverse imports there is also huge. And well, so it, there's a there's a reason that I'm pausing at this bullet statement. And I'm sorry <laughs> for dragging it down so low, but um, myself and Frederica uh, in our uh, EPGS book club, uh, there was a comment that she had made about uh, a particular, uh, was it, it's not package down, book down. There was a markdown library that uh, uh, we ran in, or she had run into a, a uh, configuration conflict. And so I was hoping to expand the topic on how do we actually check that <laughs> yeah. um, dependency uh, uh, trees. There is a package manager uh, for the use and I couldn't get the service to work. It's our, uh, it's our studio package manager, RSPM. Um, but I couldn't get the call to work within my terminal or within our studio. So um, we can expand on that subject quite extensively if, if we'd like to. Um, this, the, the final point of the introduction is the whole concept of the pipe is, is for learning humans, that's us uh, doing this, we're learning. Um, we read the, the pipe operator uh, semantically as and then. So we're going to do a function and then pass that to another function and then pass it to another function. So um, in a early book club meeting that we held, John, I think you put a lot of uh, emphasis on how to read or interpret uh, semantic or, or read code and then produce it in an English language, excuse me, not English, but just a language so that it, it, it implies a easier way of, of uh, consumption or, or thought process. So if yeah, you're you'll be, you'll be a lot more successful um, if you can like read the code mm -hmm. in, you know, in your, in English, like if you can just read it, not if you're glossing over it because you're like, you know, pipey is squiggly pipey thing. 
and you don't think of it as the thing it's actually doing, it's harder to actually understand, like really um, internalize what you're reading. Like I, I read a lot of uh, like deep learning um, journal papers and there will be math in there that I'm not really super clear on. And I notice that I'll just like kind of gloss over it. And that's where, you know, I, I think I brought it up in a different club, but I bought this book which is just like a uh, an index of mathematical notation for exactly this reason, so that I can go through and say, okay, I don't I don't have to understand this equation, but I want to understand like, conceptually what is it trying to do? Is it is that what does that symbol mean that I've never or if I've used it, I haven't used it in thirty years? Let me. Um, see what this symbol means and oh okay I can kind of understand what they're getting at with that equation without even if I can't fully understand it and so having a word my point there is having it's a word a for things profile. is yep, yep. super important to actually understand things I was going to joke you, about Milton <clears throat> oh go ahead Sandra sorry can you Becky. put a link to oh, the book, book? In the chat? yes thanks oh sure yeah. I'm sorry about that no I I think you mean the book that the I just held mathematical up. Mathematical notation. Yeah. That oh, sounds yeah. really interesting. Yeah, someone, I don't remember where someone pointed it out to me. And I was like, oh, yes. Um, and I will do this right away. Okay. On a completely <laughs> separate side note, 100% uh, 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 outside of the realm of our studio, but it does have an effect on if you start to really exercise a lot of intricate code is uh, LaTeX. And there's a, a LaTeX reference document uh, pronounced L or spelled L-E-T-X. Uh, everyone reads it as, as LaTeX, but that's not correct. Um, the tech language, LaTeX. And uh, within writing an equation uh, with LaTeX, it will also help in comprehending what the equation is doing. Um, John, I don't know if you've ever expanded on, on LaTeX as a language at all, or if anybody else is. In, yeah, in I, I've, I've used uh, use it enough that I'm one of the nerds who says LaTeX. So. Okay, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> Good point. Uh, and I want to, technically, yeah. it's a chi. The, mm -hmm. the letter at the end is a chi, not an X, because the whole point of the word is to use exactly. parts of LaTeX to write it anyway. Um, go ahead, uh, Federica. I wanted to, to, to say that... Um, the, this this um, pipe operator now is will be included within base R. There is yeah? there is a pipe operator in base R. The if you see, um, and uh, then, yeah, that one. Um, I, I, I was going to okay. save it until we were talking about the alternate pipes. So this is new. It's only in base R as of uh, okay. yeah. 4 or 4.1. I can't remember when it came in. Uh -huh. I right. haven't personally adopted it yet because if someone has an older version of R, the code just won't work if you put the, mm -hmm. the base R pipe in. Um, yes, I've, I've read something in the Slack within our lady Slack. Uh, and uh, I said that uh, um, maybe I misunderstood the thing that the classical pipe operator would be uh, included within base R and then moved to the new pipe operator. So you, then you can use both. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, the no. thing. Uh, yeah well, the walrus operator is a different thing, and we yeah, may I or didn't may want to that, but okay. so. The you know this I'm pipe, the same thing. The Magritte pipe yeah. is not in base R, and it will not be. Okay. In base R. Um, okay. And Good. so the one, this one, it behaves mostly the same as the Magritte pipe. If you're working okay. with the tidyverse, just use the Magritte pipe. Um, if you're coding, uh, like something that's that has to be really fast, the base, the new base R pipe is technically faster than the Magritte pipe. Um, what faster means in this? Context? Like it executes faster by microseconds. Like it's not that big of a difference, but but it'll it'll. Um, what happens is the R interpreter. Like if you say, um, not faster uh, in if, typing it because miss a, a, a character. Just but for the computer, the yeah, yeah, for oh, the computer okay. to actually execute the code, it's faster. So let's say if you have that with the new base R pipe, where it's a pipe into a function, um, it actually like rewrites it as that before it 
like when it's reading it. So it, it has absolutely no difference between okay. using the pipe or not using the pipe. The interpreter sees it exactly the same. Whereas mm -hmm. the McGritter pipe, it actually has to like run it through this function that is the pipe and do, you know, it, it adds a tiny, tiny, tiny um, overhead to the code. Mm -hmm. So if your code's being executed, I mean, even one million times isn't enough to really notice the difference. It has to be millions of times for it to, you know, like probably billions of times before you really notice any difference in speed. And like I said, I haven't adopted the base R pipe yet because it is slightly different. And um, we have some servers at work that are running older versions of R. And so my code wouldn't work on those servers and I haven't had time to update them yet, basically. So it's almost um, kind of the similar debate of like data frame versus data table, right? You're, you, you won't exercise the, the speed efficiency of data table until you're dealing with millions, if not billions of records of data, right? Right. Uh, it's the memory allocation or the memory processing, the flops of the CPU uh, as, it, mm -hmm. as it has to transpose the code before it actually renders it or, or uh, calculates the function. But right. good, good comment. Okay. Um, I only threw the walrus thing in there, uh, John, because that's actually a confusing piece to me. I was trying to compare the two and there is no relation that I can find. No. Uh, so I... I mean, like I said, we probably you you need the walrus if you're programming things like for the tidyverse or doing some some more advanced programming with the tidyverse. You learn about it in advanced R. So if we okay. go with that book club, um, it's basically means the same as equal. So if you're working with like parameters, if you're creating columns in a data frame or a data, uh, you know, a tibble. Um, all it does is the thing on the left side normally is not interpreted. So if you're saying the name of the column, it it doesn't do any parsing of that. With the walrus operator, it says parse the thing on the left to create the name of the column and then assign this thing to that parsed name. Okay. Um, again, not important to, to know yet. <laughs> in the comment that it, it's it's in the advanced R book automatically says we probably shouldn't discuss it at the moment, <laughs> um, but yeah. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my own uh, <laughs> continuing research on that topic. So um, all of our chapters always start out with the library uh, uh, in question. So again, this is, uh, I'm making a code snippet here of importing or, or uh, exercising the library uh, McGritter. Okay. Next topic. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to start uh, viewing different methods of coding with uh, uh, unnested uh, ob object variables, uh, nested functions, and then finally how the pipe benefits all of this. Um, what I am doing here is uh, stepping through. <clears throat> so I slightly reordered the text in the book uh, as far as its uh, linear reading profile. So I'm going to, it, it appears like I'm jumbling things together, but I felt it, it flowed better in a presentation in this manner. So the first example that we're showing is going to give us uh, object uh, notation. So we're creating an object labeled A uh, using the dplyr package and filtering, calling from the MT cars. We're going to uh, pull out anything that is great uh, in the carb. I think that's carburetor uh, of greater than one. We're going to pull that out and, and list it and populate it in that object A. Then we create another object B, we do another function, we create C, another function, and then finally D, another function. After it's all said and done with, right, we've wa we worked through this objective workflow, we're going to print out the variable D, or sorry, the object D. That's, if it's not efficient, and it will definitely bite you in the butt at a later point as your scripts become larger, and especially with wrangling. So I put a link here, um, Actually, maybe it's a little further down. No, uh, I had a note here. One of my favorite discussions is Jenny Bryant during the, the uh, PlotCon uh, uh, presentation. Um, it's her Lego presentation, or she has some mix in there. And she makes a reference to reading in your data once and then using the pipe or the workflow, uh, pipe workflow, uh, to change, modify, update, and then finally output some uh, visible view. And that fits within the tidyverse model. It fits within what Ms. Bryant was, was explaining. It fits within a good use of, of language. Now, 
I'll be perfectly forward and say that this was how I was managing all of my code. Uh, not this example, but a, a similar uh, exercise. Um, and what I found is I had my environment had, I don't know, a hundred different objects and I'm trying to figure out well, what, what does that object did or do and, and what did I change to, to ma manipulate here? Okay. So one of the uh, comments here is, is uh, we're creating uh, A through D uh, as placeholders, objects that are nothing more than memory space to hold the output of a function. The difference is each of these can be called upon in future script. Okay, well, maybe if that's the way you want to write your code, nobody's going to stop you. But if you work within a larger group or a larger, a larger team, um, there may be some styles, uh, style guides that are being deployed. And so um, if you were to work within this team of members, uh, your code is going to be really spaghetti. It's going to be really broken apart and difficult to understand what's going on. Okay. The next point is where we start to nest functions. Now, if you've ever dealt with YAML files, which is yet another markup language, or had to deal with JSON variables and, and tab delimited media, um, this may look somewhat familiar. What we're having difficulty here is that when you tab code, it's hard to understand the functions because you start at the beginning and then you break out from the, the uh, uh, what is happening before and what is happening after. Um, as a tech writer, as a person that it works with uh, uh, reading material, you never want your reader to stumble or, or hit a speed bump in trying to comprehend what you're getting across. This would be a good example in a, a, a scripting form of that speed bump. Okay, It's doing the identical uh, uh, points that we had above in our first example. It's just written in a different form. Okay. This is considered a tab uh, delimited function or, or a nested function where you're, if I were to remove all the white space here and just create this really long string, right? You start at the beginning and start working out what exactly is going on. Okay. Lastly is nesting is a long function. Uh, nesting a long function is acceptable in some languages. Uh, it may even be preferred. And my first thought is JavaScript and C++. Um, you create these really long uh, functions that are usually uh, tab delimited in some form. Python forces you to do that too. Um, and it may be the preferred method of how you write your text or write your script. Um, however, given the structure of our studio and its plethora of packages, there is no need to follow that profile. Um, nobody's going to stop you from doing it um, unless you start to uh, receive critique from other advanced users. Finally, we use the pipe. Now, this is actually where the uh, chapter is, is derived from. And if, if anybody had read the chapter, um, you'll notice that I'm not using the uh, uh, bunny foo-foo hopping through the forest. Uh, I, I wanted to change that to make it something that anybody can run. Um, the bunny foo-foo examples will work. Uh, I also, John, to your benefit in our past conversations, uh, I really took away the statement of applying the package that is calling on the function itself uh, using the, the double comma, a uh, double colon. So I did append all of the code examples that I show with what package is actually run, uh, re rendering it. Okay. Any comments at all from the team? With this third example, uh, it not only reduces the complexity, uh, you're building a pipeline to process the empty cards data set. There's no difference in the computation from the first example, only now everything is in memory. Uh, so you're not able to call on object A, object B, object C. Everything is within this contained pipeline. All of your passing with the pipe operator is uh, do a filter and then group by and then summarize and then arrange. Um, I didn't include the output of these, at least in this first example. I will later on in the uh, presentation. But if you were to run all three of these code blocks, they're giving you the identical output. They're just written in a different form. There is a statement here. Uh, there is a chunk within our text, almost a page and a half, where the author, Hadley Wickham, was uh, talking about the pry R uh, package. Uh, I didn't feel that it really 
helped at all other than it was talking about memory space and that R is very efficient in that case. Um, using data frames or lists vectors, uh, it's going to be efficient in uh, merging, combining, manipulating, changing, wrangling that data, munging that data. Uh, what it was doing is showing us different memory allocations to the empty cars data set as we went through uh, each of these functions, showing you that uh, it doesn't change. The memory is the same. It's 3.89 megabytes. And the even by manipulating it, it does increase in memory footprint, uh, but it's not excessively large like you're reprinting the entire data frame over again. So if anybody wants to know more about that prior package, um, I didn't send a link, but um, John, during the, the development of the presentation, I didn't feel that it was important to really uh, uh, roll over. There was a lot of text. Yeah. Um, I, like, yeah, it's not worth learning that package. Actually, it's, it's partly been... Um, Deprecated. Th yeah, there's there's the lobster package now, which is like the new prior. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's it's just showing, you know, okay, there's RAM things that R deals with. Most of the time, you don't need to worry about that. And he goes into it a lot more in an advanced R. And if, you do, if you're writing the kind of code where you have to worry about that, probably read advanced R. Um, so. Going beyond this slide, so now we start to discuss use cases, right? So I'm going to go back to the very first example of where we were creating the objects A, B, C, and D, and then applying the functions to them. What we're doing is you can overwrite your data, right? So I ingest a CSV, I connect to a, a, a website, I'm, I'm using an API call to pull in some, some data, whatever the case may be. Once it is in memory, now that you have this data frame in memory, or this, this uh, lists of list uh, matrix, whatever the, the form is, once you have that, if you, it, there's nothing saying that you can't overwrite as you manipulate it, right? So if I'm grouping, I'm joining, I'm splitting, I'm, I'm ungrouping, as I'm doing all of this wrangling process, I can overwrite the data. Where this becomes a problem is that if I need to go back and, uh, I don't know, take it from a sanitized standpoint, um, you have to walk through your script all over again. Uh, you have to ingest it all over again. So there's a there's a cost benefit. Going back to Jenny Bryant's uh, uh, plot con or, or the, uh, the 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 uh, link that I had sent to the YouTube video, there's a comment that she's making in there of read it in once and then with the pipe uh, operator, you can manipulate and output whatever you want, but you're never actually changing the ingested data frame. Okay. So one method of wrangling data is just overwrite and reassign calculations to its original object. Overwriting an object prevents clean debugging. <laughs> it, it, um, again, I, I mentioned before early on in, in scripting, um, I was just reassigning uh, as I went through a function to my data frame. Uh, and by the time I got to the end, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. So I start all the way back at the beginning again. That debugging process, um, if you know that you're working with clean data or, or the tidyverse model of, of what tidy data looks like, um, you don't change that. You just work within the uh, a work pipe workflow of, of what you're doing. And then finally, the other is the repetition of the object being transformed implies, what does my data look like now? So you may find yourself in this habit of uh, calling out, you know, this is object A, I do a function and now I'm calling it A2 uh, or B and then B2, or maybe you call your variables my data or your objects my data. I got my data one, and then maybe I have my data one plus transformation, right? It, it, it really starts to get a little funny to, to debug somebody else's code if they do this. If you want to make yourself crazy, continually read a new copy of your data just to walk through the process over again. Um, if we work with large data sets, Sandra, I was thinking of you when I made that thought, um, DNA strings, uh, DNA uh, data sets, they're, they're probably fairly large. I don't know that for a fact. I don't work in that field, but I presume they are. And if you were to incur the cost of waiting five minutes for your uh, uh, CSV ingestion to the computer to process it, um, you're really kind of twiddling your thumbs waiting. Okay, this is not conducive to efficiency. So, all right. 
continuing on. Okay, so this is the early uh, meeting that, or uh, beginning of the presentation, John and I were talking about uh, transformations. I failed to add the link to our repo, so that should be corrected now, I hope. Uh, but the Magritte re reassembles the code in a pipe to form, uh, excuse me, reassembles the code in the pipe to a form that works by overriding an intermediate object. Well, when you read the word lexical, the first thought that comes to mind in, in my own memory is the language, any, any uh, language. Uh, it's always a lexical uh, association, letters, numbers, etc. That's not the same definition of what we're talking about here. Lexical transformations are a placeholder in memory that just says, I'm going to call on this dot something. Okay. Um, again, if you watch the video, uh, there's a comment in there where it talks about dot X and dot F. Dot X is your, your uh, data, and then dot F would be your function uh, using the dot notation. Uh, and I believe, John, is that a base R convention? The dot notation? Uh, no, actually, no. that was something that they adopted, I think, specifically within the tidyverse. And it's just um, the dot notation in the functions is to avoid collision with normal names of things, since things can be passed in as dot, dot, dot. They didn't want to run into other, you know, like um, the name of a column is un is less likely to start with a dot. So that's all that those are for. When I was reading this um dot notation thought process, uh, namespace variables, or if you've ever dealt with URLs or any sort of, of uh, string of, of memory, right, memory allocation. Within the pipe, the dot itself is just a placeholder. It is right. an assigned memory value. If you could, I don't think you can access it, but it, there is a, a number uh, or a hex value associated to it. And so within the pipe, it's just using that dot form. I didn't extract the code snippet, um, it kept giving me problems. So I don't have the example, but if you if you look at your textbook, um, uh, the document, uh, there's a, a code chunk where it, it talks about what uh, McGritter is doing under the hood. And so going back to the statement that John had made earlier, uh, talking about the new uh, or Frederica's uh, uh, pipe operator uh, within base R, that's where that efficiency comes in. Um, it doesn't have to transpose it into another form before it processes it. The base R pipe operator just uh, uh, changes it to its its raw function form. So. Yeah, I'm so I'm typing a thing real quick that I want to. Okay. Um, uh, um, I'll just do this. So with the dot thing, you know, you can use the dot in a McGritter pipe to refer to whatever is coming in or coming from the pipe. So um, if, you know, if the thing that you want to get the argument is the second argument, for example, you can put this, what I just put in chat, where B equals dot to say that is whatever comes in from the pipe. And that is a um, McGritter specific thing. You can't put the new base R pipe into that same code like this will not work. Um, the, in the base R version, uh, the, the thing coming from the pipe has to be the first argument to the function. Um, there are ways around it. I don't know them off the top of my head because like I said, I haven't really started learning the base R pipe yet, but with the base R pipe, they also introduced a shorthand for writing functions. And the reason they reintroduced it is it's how you get around this problem. Um, I haven't learned it yet. So um, because, a... yeah, go ahead, Ryan. I, well, I was gonna, I was gonna bring up the, uh, yeah, not not negative. I don't, I don't think there's anything really negative to say about the pipe operator from a gritter, but um, it is only local to the function itself or to the the pipe workflow itself. Um, the, the it means the pipe won't work in a two class, uh, or two classes of functions. You can't pass it from one function to another function unless it's inside that pipe flow. Um, that really what we're getting at is more of a computer science type model. It's not a global variable. You can't just call on it from another function. You can't pass it back out again. Um, it's probably a little more advanced than the topics at hand, but um, it won't allow you, you have to use it within its current environment. If you are to call on it 
outside, it must be explicit, but we'll, I'll talk about that in the assignment uh, operator here later on. John, can I just ask you to, to clarify? And so in the first in chat, right? So you have A and then my fung A is equal to 10, B is equal to dot. So where, what does the dot oh, mean there? I, sh I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have reused A. I'm sorry. I was trying to type fast. Um, so no let me retype that in a way that's easier to talk about. Okay. Um, and I'll uh, pause here, John, to let you explain what's going yeah. on with that chat. Okay, so that that is easier to talk out. So here, um, my fun has two arguments, arg1 and arg2. And I'm saying arg1 gets 10, and arg2 gets what comes from the, the pipe. Normally, whatever comes oh. from the pipe goes into the first argument. But you can use the dot to send it wherever you want. Or you can use it like to reference it within the function call. There, there are different uses you can do with the dot. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it, that you just are doing it, you're, you're being specific or uh, putting it into a specific place. I guess the other, um, reason that you would want to do that is let's say arg1 has an arc, has a default that you like, that you want to keep the default. So you could just do that. Um, and that way you're telling it. Send send whatever comes from the pipe. Send A into arg two. Um, now, mm -hmm. in this specific case, I wouldn't do this. I would just say arg two equals A without the pipe. But you know, if yeah. it's at the end of a longer pipe, it's whatever the pipe has at that point in the chain um, is what the dot means. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, that's super yeah. useful. <laughs> yes. Yes, Sandra. If you if you want to give me just a second, I'll talk about the T pipe here in a second. Yeah, uh, and that's another way that you can send your output outside of the environment of the the pipe itself. Um, awesome. And I know this definition is kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but when you're when you're inside that pipe workflow, everything is uh, uh, local to itself or within its own little environment as it's processing. So the dot notation is just saying, hey, I'm just putting this out here. Uh, just grab whatever's in that memory that I just processed and, and then pass it in again to the next uh, uh, the next calculation within the pipe workflow. Um, this content uh, concepts of of uh, environmental variables versus global variables, that's a that's Earlier, when we were talking about the object and assigning it, you know, A, B, C, and D, that's more of a global concept because we can we can start working working with that inside the pipe. It's all kind of a self-contained little function or package. Um, I don't want to use the word black box, but that's uh, a, a notation that everyone uh, writes about. It's this unknown operation. I don't know what's going inside here. I'm giving it. I'm passing it something, and then I'm getting an output from it. Um, that pipe interpretation is like that black box theory so i have a question then so when you're using pipes and this might be really a dumb naive question but it has to be saving all of those intermediate steps in memory somehow right so you're not formally assigning it to an object but so it, how does that work um it's it's basically it's composing a new function that's made up of all your functions and oh. so like the things are briefly in RAM and then they are passed into the new function and no, well, really it's more like as if you wrote it out with all the parentheses, like it's mm -hmm. it's executing it kind of all at once because R, the way R executes, it doesn't actually execute the code until it needs it. And so- mm, I see, okay. It, yeah, it, it's, it's complicated. Again, fully understanding it takes more, some of the R, advanced R, concepts but mm -hmm. basically it's it it's as if it's creating a new function so that you're really just passing your whole thing through just one function right okay so in that case yeah the nested would make more sense because that tends to be like inside out but i can see how one, one thing depends on the other depends okay right. that's yep. okay <laughs> Thank you. Comment. Uh, well, I, I guess I just had another epiphany that, that I may share. If you're going to build a house, you're not going to 
put the frame together before you put it on the foundation or pour the foundation. So if, if you think of, of building a house as like a pipe workflow, you've got to have the foundation. You've got to be able to put your framing up there before you can, you can put your drywall and sheeting and, and, you know, your flooring and, and painting, et cetera. There's a sequence of events that must be processed. Uh, and so that, I guess, contractor that's putting it together can do everything. And it's, it's, you're just calling it, say, build me a house. And then magically all this uh, other operations happen, but it's in that sequential manner, I guess. Okay. Maybe a so then can I ask technology. one more question? So is this just for readability for humans then? Because in a sense, the machine wouldn't care? Absolutely. Like a hundred percent. That is what it's for. Um, okay. One of uh, my favorite, like kind of elucidating, what does the pipe mean? Mm -hmm. um, Hadley Wickham has a tweet that he did that this is, um, what is this? Working nine to five. The song uh, "Working Nine oh, to yeah. Five as Dolly a pipe Parton. chain. Yep. Yeah. So I, and then tumble out of equals bed, and then stumble to equals the kitchen. Like, um, and there are some replies in that thread where people made did other songs as pipes. It is purely for readability. I think that is like a really important thing to get out of this chapter. That the pipe is there, and it's kind of like the big. I don't know, argument in R. So the tidyverse in general is written for humans. It's written to be readable by humans. It's to make your work um, easier as far as like communicating with other people doing the same thing and, and make it easy to learn. Versus like data.table is kind of the alternative to the tidyverse. It's written for computers. It's written to be super efficient and it's a really kind of esoteric um, argument style that I, under, I I accept that probably once you learn it, it isn't as hard, but it's it's a much, um, I guess, technically a much shallower learning curve. There's a lot more to learn. So you've got to just keep learning and learning and learning. Um, but it's, it is faster because it's written closer to the, you know, it's more like the nested parentheses way of doing things that, yeah, that's more efficient, but it's super hard to, look, to read. And yeah, so, yeah. The, the, you know, the tidyverse errs on the side of, hey, humans have to be able to read this code too. The computer, if you're saving a computer a few milliseconds, who cares in most cases? And so the tidyverse says the computer can do the hard work. The human will do the easier work. Um, and I don't know, probably from the way I explained all that, I, I agree. <laughs> like I'm on the side of making the code readable. I, occasionally, like I, I write, um, packages for internal use where it does matter. Um, like it's something that's going to be used probably billions of times. And so I do need to save those microseconds, uh, mm. but not often, <laughs> you know, most of the time I just use pipes because it's easier to read. It took me a long time actually to come around on pipes. I was like, this is this new convention that doesn't, I don't understand it. Like it, it was hard. And really part of it was learning. And then like, if once you can read the pipes, it's like, oh yeah, that, that just makes way more sense than a big nested set of parentheses that you're trying to drill down to what actually happens first. Like, you know, if I've got some data frame, if you're in nested parentheses, the data frame is like in, you know, the, the end of the parentheses, it's like the last thing. And then, then it, the next to last thing is the first thing you do to the data frame and then, yeah. et, yeah. et cetera. You have to work backwards to figure out what actually happens versus in the pipe, you start with the data frame and then go through the steps in order. Like the way it's written is in order. It's way easier to understand as a human reading the code. And then the computer looks at it and basically runs the pipe backwards. Kinda, right, right, you know. right. Okay. So that's that's actually really good to understand. Because sometimes I'm just like, if I don't know someone how it works, then I'm just like making all sorts of assumptions. <laughs> right. And so yeah. Okay. One of one of my only only critiques I'm having, and it's it's me, it's not <laughs> anybody else, it's just me, is being able to access a variable inside the pipe workflow. Um, that's something like, hey, I've already done that. Let me go grab that and pull it back out again. But I'll answer that question here in a second. I haven't <laughs> used it yet, but um, I think I've, I've, I've figured out what I can do there uh, to get around it. Um, the next slide, we've got, uh, I think, three more slides left before we're done with this, this uh, 
one upcoming is, is fairly lengthy. Um, when not to use the pipe? When do you not want to deploy the pipe? One of it is if your steps are, sorry, yeah, your pipes are not longer than say 10 steps. This is just an arbitrary value. Uh, and again, as John mentioned, it's just for human readability. Um, if you have a really, really long, you know, 20, 30 step pipe, and uh, you're trying to understand, comprehend what it's all doing, um, you might want to break that into smaller chunks. And that's the reference they're making in the text is, is you want to kind of limit this to a, a quick, short, sweet, uh, sweet um, pipe operation and maybe pass it over to another assignment and then do another pipe. So kind of break these up into smaller manageable chunks. If you have multiple inputs or outputs, this is the one that is tricky. Um, it's partly why in the shiny environment, um, pipes can be a little bit tricky. If you're dealing with reactive code or if you're dealing with any inputs and outputs, pipes are not your friend. Um, they will actually kind of step in the middle of everything because it's very localized to that single uh, lexical transformation, single environment variable, um, the dot notation we were talking about, you can't do other things with it. Okay. And then finally, the last statement is, if you're starting to think about a directed graph with a complex dependency structure, um, I didn't quite comprehend what that bullet statement stated, <laughs> but I believe what it's implying is that if you were to, um, what's that uh, drawing board, if you were to draw out kind of UML functioning of what your, your, your uh, code is doing, and then if you start to branch out, like if else statement type stuff, it's not, the pipe's not going to work. There's no way that you can call on that within the pipe itself, uh, or at least I haven't found a, a, uh, a uh, example of that being used. Um, John, do you have any thoughts on that statement? Uh, not a lot. Um, and actually, it's so it, it depends what you're doing with graphs, because there is the tidy graph package that is for working with graphs in a more pipe like approach. Um, but the idea is if, you know, if you're doing something that doesn't have a like clean and then, and then, and then, but it has all kinds of connections in between, um, it won't work to use a pipe and just conceptually like, you know, it comes down to, I think basically if you have two inputs, two or more inputs that are both being piped, technically you can put like a pipe inside of another pipe and you can do some things, but you'll recognize where, oh, I can't make this work with a pipe. That's when you don't use a pipe. Um, I was sitting here kind of trying to imagine like, you know, if there would be a logical way to code where you kind of start from two things and then you're piping them both down to one function together. But just like, I can't really picture what that code would look like, you know? <laughs> um, you might have like one pipe that ends in a dot or something and then another pipe that ends in and then you combine them, whatever. Usually when I, you do that, you end up just splitting it into two, you know, I'll assign thing one to this pipe, thing two is this other pipe, and then thing three is those two put together in some function. Um, so that's, yeah. <laughs> I was going to add one more comment to this and it's not in the list, but um, if you're doing the GG plot book, um, mm -hmm. the, the whole pipe operator versus GG plots side of how that works, um, that will stop you in your tracks really quick. Um, that's probably a really hard muscle memory thing to comprehend when you're writing ggplot uh, uh, visualizations, uh, graphical objects. Um, it uses the plus inside, uh, instead, uh, but that's their sort of pipe, I guess. Yeah, he, your layers. he wrote ggplot to just before... Um, I don't remember the gentleman's name who wrote the who wrote McGritter originally, but he just before he found out about McGritter, he wrote ggplot2, and he talked about like he thought about going back and making it use the pipe. But I actually like kind of thinking of it as different. Like the pipe is for your data manipulation, yep. and the plus is for building a layered graph, you know, a, a plot, and keeping them different. I have come around to, but yeah, it is confusing. Um, that they are different. It, always remember it's in graphical objects, it's layers. So yep. when you add the layers, the plus sign does make sense mathematically or, or if, you, if you think of it that way. Um, so 
the I think this is the last uh, uh, <laughs> slide, but other tools in the greater package. So I mentioned the left hand side versus right hand side. There's a lot of discussion when you look at the left hand side of the pipe and the right hand side of the pipe and how it's actually managed. Um, this will come into play as we talk about these other forms of, of pipe notation. So Sandra, I'm going to come back to your earlier comment about being able to uh, uh, pull anything out or, or access it in memory, the dot notation concepts, et cetera. I stated that uh, I may have solved the problem now that I've read this chapter, and that's the T pipe. Now think of it as in plumbing, an actual T in a, in a flow of operation. So we're tapping into a particular uh, 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 function, uh, a process, a, a, a process of this pipe workflow. And I want to plug in and pull out whatever was being uh, manipulated at that time. So in this case or this example, uh, the first one says uh, when working with more complex pipes, it's sometimes useful to call out a function for its side effects. And the side effects is again, just an arbitrary term that we're using here. It's whatever that other function does, right? Let's just take it out of the pipe workflow and, and do something else. Um, it returns the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side. And that's where the LHS and RHS uh, comes into play. The first example is just using the pipe by itself and then plotting out a, a, uh, a graphical object. So again, using the, uh, uh, sorry, John, I wanted to make a note here. If anybody has problems with their R blocks in R markdown, um, this particular code snippet didn't work unless I called directly into that block, that library package. And I know that's an environmental thing. I just couldn't figure out why I kept getting an error. So um, the we're creating uh, our norm of 100 pass, uh, and then create a matrix uh, with n columns of two and then uh, plot that uh, and then provide its string, output its string. So the first object we're not doing anything with and we're returning a value of null because it's already done, it's already processed, it's, it's created its object output. So the string is nothing. When we run this again using the T pipe and Sandra, this hopefully will help in comprehension of memory of, of what these different pipe functions are doing. If we use the T pipe, what we're doing is exporting the matrix with that end column of two. So it does, the graph is a slightly different and I haven't figured out why it changed between the two. If we, if we stack them on top of each other, they are slightly different. What we're doing is pulling out what that is doing. So we've got one through 50 uh, with a two column and then the variables of that uh, uh, and uh, number uh, call. John, do you mind if I ask why it was that the graphs look slightly different? Because it's it starts with um, random numbers at the top, and it's oh, new random numbers. That, the R norm okay. R norm one hundred is give me a hundred points basically. Just random mem or man random numbers. Yeah, give me a hundred numbers, and okay. so um, if yeah. I were to make that a a a object and then call the object in the pipe, then it right. would maintain the same. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing, just real quick, is. Um, I think, and actually now I've got to check to make sure I'm right, but STR is the structure of structure. the Sorry. underlying object. Right. Yes. Not um, yes. Okay. So could you say that um, that T-pipe is a way to visualize an intermediate step so that you get it as an output? It's a way to use an in intermediate step. So to use, okay. So but I thought what it was doing was just plotting the exact same plot, the, of course, with different numbers, but then it's also giving you the output of what that matrix looks like. So the the plot is what you are teeing into. Your, your side, it's, you're doing like a side branch of, okay, let's send our, our pipe over into the plot. But then okay. because of the T, it's as if that plot line wasn't there and you continue on to whatever's below it. So when you call the STR, you're getting the structure of the thing that went in, into the plot, but the plot just executed on the side. So that's the T plot. You know, you could have it save and a lot of save different save things. Well, actually a lot of save things return what goes into them, but not everything. Um, okay. And so, you know, you might want to, or, or maybe at some point in your plot, you just want to like log 
you know, and depending what you're working with, it might write something to a log just saying kind of where it is in the process. So you could have this function happen that's totally separate. You tee off into that function, but then the step after that is just continuing as if you had never done that, the T. I don't, oh. I think I've used the T like twice in three years, maybe, <laughs> you know, um, but it is good to know it exists. Uh, I probably could use it more if I remembered it existed more often. Um, I'm sure there have been cases where it, it would have been useful. A lot of times what I'll end up doing is just saving the object, do the thing that's on the side, and then continue the pipe from the, you know, the, the right. assigned object. Right. And the, the yeah, T lets you sense. avoid doing that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Would, John, okay. is it, could I say that, that we can create objects using the T? So like at a point in time within the workflow, export this kind of like shove it off to the side because I want to use it for something else. I, I, that was actually what I was trying to solve. I didn't know if that was possible. Uh, probably. Um, I, I think it would call on the assignment operator, but that's another topic yeah. down below. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm not sure. Give me a minute. <laughs> All right. I, well, I, I may be twisting, Go ahead. Yeah. twisting things slightly. Um, the next pipe option or, or a, a, a different form of the pipe within uh, McGritter is going to be this dollar sign. And that's called the exposition pipe. Um, exposition, it's actually you're exploding the data. So um, it explodes out the variables in the data frame so that you can refer to them explicitly. As an example, uh, we're taking a, a, a correlation uh, of X and Y variable and calling on the display column, just dis displacement, displacement column and the miles per gallon column and making a, a XY correlation between them, uh, giving us a, an output, uh, that mathematical correlation function. So what is happening with that uh, exploding or output point is give me whatever it was that the pipe generated. Um, I believe you could expand that further and maybe that's another way of accessing what's going on inside the pipe. Uh, using that, that uh, either T-pipe or this exploded pipe con comment. And then the final example is the assignment pipe. Now this one is just a greater than and less than symbol uh, combined. And the easiest way to show what is going on is uh, calling on empty cars twice or the text, uh, uh, using the text empty cars twice. So we're creating a data frame empty cars and then populating it with empty cars as a transform by cylinder multiplied by two. Where the assignment operator comes in is a simpler way or a more concise way, eloquent, eloquent way of assigning all of that previous example into a one line code, uh, one line string. So I'm creating the object empty cars uh, and I'm, I'm just calling on the data set empty cars again, transforming it uh, and then populating it back in. It's not a, it's, it's a reassignment of that object. So the opinion of the author, Mr. Wickham says uh, a little bit of duplication, repeating the names of objects twice is fine in return for making assignments more explicit. Um, he, his comment was that he would rather, there's so much emphasis on the uh, less than hyphen type of assignment operator to go ahead and use that uh, uh, primarily uh, and that to be careful, it does exist that you can use this uh, form of syntax, but it, it may be a little confusing on what it's doing. So, uh, Sorry, Ryan, is that the same as using the pipe, the, the classical pipe and mutate? You can do this, you, you obtain the same uh, the same result. I think, well, it's, mutates just dplyr oriented, right? But, uh, if yeah. you go back to the slide, right? Sorry, I, I think. Stitch it together. Oh. Well, so you know when you go past it and it, it blanks out on you. Sorry about that. Basically, um, I'm gonna write two lines that are equivalent in theory, if I can type. <laughs> so the 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 two-headed pipe or the the assignment pipe is the same as assign and then you know um pipe and assign to the same variable name 
So that's where the empty cars, like these two blocks of code that Ryan has are doing the exact same thing. So it, it's um, start with empty cars and transform it, and then basically also assign it back to empty cars. I uh, This is kind of like Hadley says, I prefer the one where you explicitly say it because you get it, it's too easy to miss that there's an assignment happening there. And you'll forget that you reassigned empty cars with a new thing and um, just, you know, it's easy to lose track of. Um, yeah, technically it, it saves a few keystrokes, but not a lot because um, I don't have a hotkey for the two-headed pipe. So, you know, it, you know in, in our studio, it actually doesn't save that many keystrokes to type it that way. Um, does that make sense? I can, I can use the mutate as well. Um, it, it's not it's not a difference. I mean, yes, you yes you could use mutate. Um, but that's not what he's like. It changed the word transform in both of these blocks of code to mutate, and it would still be the same thing. It's that the two blocks of code are identical whatever functions you might use. Um, you know, like if I say I want to do empty cars gets, um, I don't know, head of empty cars. Uh, that you could do empty cars gets empty cars piped to head, or you could say empty cars uh, assignment pipe head. All of those three pieces of code do exactly the same thing. It's just that the, so technically the, the last one is, um, you know, more efficient typing or whatever, but that's what we're um, Hadley saying that in his opinion, a little bit of duplication, like the middle one. Yeah, okay, I had to type a little bit more. There's some duplication of, of uh, MT cars, but it's a lot clearer what's happening that you're, running empty cars through head and assigning it back to empty cars. Is that, is that making sense? All right. John, I was gonna add one more statement to this thought. Okay. If you are learning R, if you're learning scripting, if you're learning how to uh, call on these functions and a lot of, so one of the, one of the biggest uh, critiques currently within the CRAN library of all the, the vignettes and, and PDFs and code examples, et cetera, is that there is a variance. The tidyverse pipe, or I guess Magritter pipe operator, isn't always used in a lot of the code examples because they predate. So mm. what I'm what I'm trying to get across is that if you're reading a forum, if you're reading you know the documentation, if you're uh, uh, attempting to deploy a particular function and having difficulty or or writing it and, and using the code examples as a as a framework, a base uh, framework, continue do what makes you comfortable, what makes you what what makes it work. Um, efficiency and and human readability uh, are a secondary. They'll come with time as you gain maturity and confidence in your in your writing ability. So uh, I don't know if uh, another dumb example would be, you know, in in early uh, elementary school we learn to to write you know the alphabet within the the lines of you know uh, text. Well, yeah, some kids are kind of scribbling and others are very very precise. Uh, it, that's actually a uh, another psychology trait, but um, at any rate, learning that initially and then being able to I don't know write an entire uh, document or an opus uh, uh, with all of the learned traits of of what you you learned in elementary school, it will come with time and maturity. So write what you write what works, write what runs, and then you can always go back and and modify it, make it more uh, maintainable. So. I guess that's the the whole argument of of kind of where the base R versus tidy verse R uh, logic comes from. There's huge, huge, huge debates on what direction to go initially. Right? Do I learn the tidy verse initially, you know, from the get go, and that's the only thought that I have, and then all of a sudden I see this base R code, and I'm like, what is this? 
Um, or is it the other way around? Do you learn the base R first and then the newer form of, of using the pipe operator? Anyway, just a, uh, a topic. If you ever read a lot of forum posts, you'll see that come up quite often. Yes. Um, it is a big debate. I'm a big fan of learning the tidyverse first. I think it's the easier thing to learn. And then you can add on to it um, the base R. That is, like, there are definitely instructors who think, no, you should start from the foundation and build up or whatever. But right. um, that's all I have, John. That's the presentation. Um, we're nine minutes over on yeah. one o'clock call. So, so before we before we leave um, next week, we should be doing functions. I'm trying to think if there's any th reason I. I I plan to be here. I can't think of any reason I wouldn't be. Does anyone want to do chapter 19 functions? This is, I mean, I think I say this every week, but this is gonna be another good one. Um, it's a really important chapter and it is a longish chapter. If we end up taking two weeks on it, that would be fine. Um, so any volunteers? I can try that one. Excellent. I'm not confident that I will understand it, but I can try it. Excellent, excellent. And like I said, if you don't make it through, don't feel bad about that. It is okay. pretty meaty. Um, I will try first thing uh, like uh, Monday to Monday or Tuesday, hopefully Monday, to get some learning objectives written out for it. Um, I forgot to do that this week. So Ryan, thankfully, was able to put those together and I just made a couple little edits. Um, but yeah, I'll try to get those done. Uh, right away so that you can work from those and use them as kind of a guideline as you're uh, sorting out what you're going to present. Um, and where is the list for signing up for chapters? Is there one? We don't have one. There's so few okay. of us that I haven't bothered. I just okay. say it in the chat. Uh, so I'll go say it in a minute. And then that's what I use to remember who volunteered. Um, so I'd like to also try iterations. Okay, I, I'll go ahead and make a spreadsheet so that we can start filling it in. Because if we want to, you know, it is nice to know going down the road who's going to be doing something. Yeah, because um, I have a really hard time with for loops. So I think this uh, iterations would be helpful. Great. Yeah, that's yeah. a good reason to do things. And then, yeah, that's getting exciting because then we're into modeling and communicating. Um, modeling is being taken out of the new edition of the book because there are other things that do it better. I still think it's worth running through, but we might wanna just do kind of a summary. I don't know yet, I, um, but we're getting close to like a, an end point problem. <laughs> I don't think we should stop, but um, it's exciting. I think we're actually gonna finish this book. <laughs> All right. I, I just have sort of a heads up. Um, I have two very uh, close and tight deadlines this month. So I probably won't be able to take on any of the chapters until probably early to, I wanna say mid February. So just, I just wanted to, to put okay. that out there. I am sorry about that, but yeah. <laughs> no problem. So, okay, let me um, make a quick note to myself of okay. spreadsheet. I'll, I'll make a spreadsheet for us to sign up. Um, and I'll have that posted very, very shortly, very, very soon in the chat. And Becky is doing 19. Okay. And actually, and 21. <laughs> um, okay. Very cool. I will see everyone awesome. next week. Thanks so much, Ryan. Yeah. But thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yep. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.